Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Robin Burgess and I'm a professor here in the economics department, also director of the International Growth Center, which is one of the main sponsors of Environment Week. So the reason I'm standing up here is simply to say uh, welcome to everybody to, for Environment Week. So this is the second installation of this event. And what's interesting about it is um, it started basically from three sources. One was within the IGC, a big pivot towards sustainable growth, and that's been kind of happening for the last five years. And then within the economics department, we set up a new program and stickered on energy and the environment. And more and more PhD students started getting interested in working on this stuff. And then finally in CP, POID, center that uh, John Van Rienen directs, um, there was a big push towards innovation and diffusion and a big push towards that happening in green technology. So somehow these three groupings came together to sort of focus on, on uh, the economics, environment, and energy. And I suppose what also happened more broadly is that across the world, not just in economics, but in all areas, people just became much more interested, I guess driven largely by climate change and the realization of climate change. So when I looked at myself, you know, focused on development and poverty, suddenly this new thing came up, climate change. And the interesting thing about climate change is we have much less of an idea of what to do about it. Um, so this event, which is sort of also sponsored by Department of Geography and Environment, Grantham, many funders, UKRI, ERC, uh, and also involves some collaborations with Chicago and the Coast Project. It's sort of a, an attempt to bring together at the LSC a whole group of people, not just uh, academics, but also policymakers, which we have represented here, to try to figure out how do we move from working out, yes, something is happening, there is impacts of climate change and other forms of environment, but what do you actually do about it? And there we're really <laughs> much less cited than in many other areas of policy. So it's partly a kind of policy toolkit building thing. So I just wanted to also say this is just the first of three uh, public events. So we have two others this week. And behind this, during the day, we have 40, I think it's 40 academic talks and three uh, master classes and public things. So you can see that we filled it almost an entire week, four, four days of a week, with this stuff. And this is something which would just not have happened even five years ago. So it's a very, very big and fast-moving area where the LSC wants to have um, you know, global leadership alongside others. So without further ado, I'm going to pass to Claire Balboni, who's going to chair the session and introduce all the others. Thank you very much. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much, Robin, and thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Claire Balboni. I'm an assistant professor of economics uh, here at the LSE, uh, and I also co-direct the Stickard program on the economics of energy and the environment. So we are uh, delighted to uh, have this session today. Uh, I'm going to start with a few uh, points of housekeeping. So this session is being uh, live streamed. It's also being recorded, and the recording will be made available a few days after the event. Uh, for those of you who may wish to contribute to the conversation online, uh, feel free to use the hashtag LSE Environment Week. And if I could ask those of you in the room to please turn off your phones so that you don't uh, disrupt the session, uh, or at least put them on silent mode. Uh, we're going to have a designated time uh, towards the end of the session for Q&A from the audience, both uh, in the room and online. And could I pr please ask everybody who's asking a question to start by giving your name and your organization on. So <laughs> to get started, we're going to be focusing today on uh, air pollution, an extremely uh, important determinant of hum human well-being, a huge challenge across, uh, across the globe, uh, and focusing really on uh, innovative ways that we uh, might think about tackling this. And to do so, I'm, I'm really uh, thrilled to be able to introduce our uh, esteemed panelists here. So we will start off uh, hearing from uh, Professor Michael Greenstone. Uh, Michael is the Milton Friedman Distinguished Service Professor in Economics, uh, as well as the Director of the Becker Friedman Institute and the Interdisciplinary uh, Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. Uh, he previously served on uh, President Obama's uh, Council of Economic Advisors as the Chief Economist, uh, and in that role co-led the development of the uh, US government's social cost of carbon. 
Michael will uh, be presenting with uh, Professor Namrata Kala, who's our second uh, panelist. Namrata is an associate professor in applied economics at the uh, Sloan School of Management at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, and has research focused on uh, environmental and development uh, economics. And we will then uh, hear from uh, two uh, policymakers uh, working in this space. Uh, so we are joined uh, by Dr. Liu Jin, who is the director of the Environmental Management Program at Energy Foundation China, uh, and is also the executive director, excuse me, of the China Clean Air Policy Partnership, and a standing member of the Ozone Pollution Control Committee at the Chinese Society of Environmental Science Sciences. Uh, and finally, we will be hearing from Dr. Omar Masood, who's the CEO of the Urban Unit uh, and a member of the Pakistan Administrative Service. Uh, his work at the Urban Unit is focused on improving city responses to large challenges, and he's previously served as the Government of Punjab's Additional Secretary of Finance, uh, with more than 15 years of a diverse management experience in Pakistan's uh, civil service. So we're absolutely delighted uh, to have such a an esteemed uh, panel discussing these issues. Just very briefly in terms of the structure of the event this evening, we will hear from uh, Namrata and Michael for about half an hour or so on uh, recent research on uh, air pollution damages uh, and policies. And we will turn in the rest of the session to really trying to focus on a conversation around uh, policy solutions to address uh, this, uh, uh, to think about confronting this, this really important challenge. And in that part of the session, we will hear, uh, firstly, remarks from uh, Eugene and, and uh, Omar uh, based on their experience with policymaking confronting the set of challenges in, in China and in Pakistan, respectively. We'll follow that with 15 minutes or so of uh, discussion amongst the panel on the issues raised in those presentations. And then finally, we'll allow for 20 or so minutes of audience Q&A at the end. So with that, I'm uh, delighted to turn the... Uh, Turn over to uh, Mike and Namrata for their presentation. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much for asking me to be here today. Michael and I are going to talk about air pollution problems and some potential solutions. Um, and out of that, my job today is mostly the bad news, maybe some green shoots of hope, and then Michael's job is going to talk about uh, solutions. Uh, so this is a pretty typical day in New Delhi, that's the India Gate, and it's very hard to see precisely uh, because it's pretty polluted. This is probably a day where flights and trains all over North India are getting canceled because visibility is low. Okay, so let me just start talking about the problem which then sets up why we need a war on air pollution to begin with. So air pollution has large and sustained negative effects on mortality, human capital, productivity, and health effects all across the world. These effects are worse in developing countries, as I'll talk about. However, the damages that we see across the world, which, range, which affect billions of people, are not inevitable. And indeed, history has shown us several recent successful examples of how air pollution can be significantly curbed. And we're going to talk about some very specific solutions that have come out of these lessons, such as markets, regulatory incentives, as well as stringent regulation, and how these can make significant progress on the problem. So let me start talking about why we need uh, a war on air pollution. So first, this is a map of the world that shows you where air pollution is distributed. So this is a map of fine particulate matter. I'll tell you exactly what that is on the next slide. But the unit here is micrograms per meter cubed. A microgram is a millionth of a gram. And all this is telling you is how much of stuff in that unit is there in a column of air that's one meter on all sides. And five here is a benchmark because that's the, what the WHO says. You should be not breathing a concentration that's greater than five micrograms per meter cubed. And you can see that while that's true in a lot of the world, uh, a lot of the world is also significantly darker, which means that all the way up to greater than 16 times that concentration um, is where about 97%, or oh, oh, sorry, is, is where several billions of people live. So what does that look like? Well, in New Delhi, that's about 26 times what the WHO says you should be breathing. In Dhaka, it's 17 times. In Lahore, it's about 16 times on average. And in Kathmandu, it's eight times. And indeed, what the AQLI tells us is that about 97% of the world 
is breathing air quality that is above the threshold that the WHO has mandated as being sort of safe for us to breathe. And of course, that then means that there are lots of negative effects that are occurring um, on that dimension. So just to contextualize what I mean when I talk about PM 2.5 or PM 10, so maybe not all of us have seen sort of pollution, but all of us have seen maybe sand. And so when I say PM 2.5, I'm talking about a pollutant that is about 36 times on average smaller than sand. Um, and when this stuff gets in our bodies, it has a lot of uh, negative effects, which hundreds of studies over several decades have shown uh, pretty convincingly. And of course, you know, something that might come up is worth flagging ex ante, is identifying the causal effect of pollution is challenging because the map of the world that I showed you that showed the developing countries have worse air pollution, you can overlay a map of that with GDP per capita and you'd get an intuitive pattern. And a lot of recent work has convincingly talked about saying what is the causal effect and how do we isolate that of air pollution on mortality, morbidity, and so on. And so when we do that, we find that there's effects across the health spectrum on life expectancy, cancer risk, cardiovascular disease, uh, reproductive issues, neurological conditions, um, and so on. So when I said my part is mostly the bad news, I'm about like a third of the way in. <laughs> so let, let me take uh, one particular example that talks about how bad air pollution is for mortality. And that's going to look at a natural experiment that affects pollution exposure in China, thereby giving us some lessons about how air pollution affects mortality. And so what this paper, what this study is essentially doing is looking at a policy in China that began in the 1950s. And what the policy did is it gave municipal heating systems to a certain parts of China uh, to provide subsidized winter heating. And now these municipal heating systems were powered by coal, which generated a lot of air pollution. And what's worth pointing out is that only cities north of the river that's, that's shown by the black line here were given access to these coal-powered heating systems. And so you can see that indeed pollution exposure, which is greater for the red areas, is higher just north of the river relative to just south of the river, thereby giving a comparable population with differential pollution exposure for us to study from. Um, and the black dots here are just where mortality data was measured, and you can see it's pretty uh, widespread. And so when the authors did that, what they find is, indeed, populations that are just north of the river have about 40% higher pollution exposure, as measured by PM10. So this is the stuff that's about nine times smaller than fine beach sand. And what's also worth pointing out, that during the time period of this study, pollution on average is about five times average, sorry, five times what the WHO would recommend as being safe. So this is telling us something about the impacts of air pollution when it is already quite high. And what that translates into, this 40% higher exposure to air pollution, is about 3% lower life expectancy. Right? And so this sort of brings home, I think, quite starkly, the immediate, it, quite immediately, how a lifetime of having worse air quality has implications for how long you live. And then we can take that and say, well, how does that compare to other stuff that causes mortality? And when we stack it, we, we see that sort of PM2.5 relative to the WHO guideline is all the way on the right in terms of life years lost uh, when you're breathing more than what the WHO recommends you be breathing. It's giving tobacco a run for its money. It's about five times higher than transport injuries, uh, much higher than alcohol use, um, and so on. So this is pretty significant uh, burden of mortality in the world. And so as a result of the fact, we can take this, this life expectancy impacts and say, well, where is pollution distributed? And therefore, where do we think people are losing more life years? And this is a map of the world that does that. And so this is showing you in the parts that are quite dark colored, it's, more than, it's six years or more of life years lost as a result of really bad air quality. Uh, and you can see all the way down to almost no life years lost. We can zoom in and see, well, where is this really, really high? And you see in parts of South Asia, it's six years or more lost. Chicago is about half a year. Boston looking pretty good at about 0.2. Uh, but there's a pretty big range, and London at about 0.5. And so 
this slide is out of order, but I just couldn't keep going with all the depressing news. So here's a little bit of hope. After this slide, I have more bad news. But just to tide you over uh, for that, you know, this is not inevitable. Right? So this is showing you how over time, in these cities like London and Tokyo, these gains used to be really high in the 1970s. And then air quality got better as a result of deliberate policy measures that were taken. And today, these gains are much lower for that, for that reason. So with that bit of hope, I'm going to go right back to the bad news. All right, so this is telling you how a lifetime of breathing bad air impacts how long you live. Now let's talk about how being born into a world where pollution is lower can affect your life meaningfully as well. And so why do we think that is? Well, it's essentially because the first year of life is critical for brain growth and development of, of important mental functions like long-term memory. And pollution essentially gets inside our circulatory systems, and the brain consumes a large fraction of the body's oxygen needs. I'm already starting to see some horrified faces. Uh, I'm afraid, so there's not very much long to go. Hang in there. All right. So this is a study that looks at a US clean air policy that significantly impacted county level exposure to air pollution, and then asks the question of what does being born into a world with less air pollution do for you over the course of your lifetime? And so it's essentially comparing people who were born three years after this policy was introduced to people who were born three years before in these counties that got cleaner. And the first thing that it documents is indeed the policy was effective. So these Clean Air Act amendments in the 1970s led to a 10% reduction in county level air pollution, causing a 1% increase in lifetime annual earnings for affected cohorts that were born right after relative to ones that were born right before. So that translates into, I think, about $4,500. All right, so these are thinking about long-term exposure and how that affects mortality, how that affects lifetime earnings. What about really, really short-run exposure to air pollution, like over an hour? What does that do um, to you? So to do that, I'm going to talk about one of my papers where we collected uh, air quality data and worker productivity data at an hourly level in Indian garment factories. So that's a picture of the air pollution monitors that we installed at different points uh, in the factory. Uh, and that's a picture of people who are working. The pollution is coming from outside. It's not generated from inside the factory. And then we collected data for almost a year to try to understand how just a really short run effect of air pollution, what does that do to productivity? And what we find is that even something that's, that only lasts an hour or two has significant effects on uh, worker productivity. So at an hourly level, an increase in fine particulate matter, the stuff that's about 36 times smaller than beach sand, lowers productivity by about 1% of average productivity. And this effect lasts for several hours after that pollution shock has happened to a worker. We find larger impacts for older workers and for those that are exhibiting health symptoms consistent with pollution-related symptoms on that day. We also find that better managers are able to pick up on these productivity dips and reassign workers in terms of tasks and where they're sitting to mitigate some of this productivity effect, which sort of sheds some light on how firms can adapt to air pollution. And there's been, in fact, a spate of really interesting studies that compare productivity across a range of tasks and across a range of different types of workers. Uh, everything from how judges behave differently during high pollution hours, to fruit pickers, to textile workers, to chess players, to code on GitHub. So maybe some of you are in this data set. And they find that across the spectrum, whether you're doing something that's cognitively demanding, whether you're doing something that's pretty manual work, um, air pollution affects productivity quite negatively. OK, so now for the green shoots of hope. All the damages that I've shown you are, are not inevitable, and we can do something about it. So let me start by just showing you that this is possible. This is a picture of US air pollution progress since 1970. So as I showed you, 1970s when the Clean Air Act amendments came into play. And what you can see is for PM10, that was one of the main pollutants studied by the study that I showed you on lifetime earnings, 
um, it's gone down to several by several times today relative to what it was in 1970. SO2, uh, and other air pollutants, same story. So this has been, I think, a success story of policy. And similar effects show up if you look at UK air pollution. And so if you look at what's happened to PM10, to SO2, we see these large decreases by several times starting from 1970. This is partly technology, such as catalytic converters for cars, and a raft of regulation that the UK and Europe have worked on over the decades that have led to this. When you look at the world, the picture is, of course, a lot more mixed. So the world right at the bottom shows a bit of an increase, maybe a bit of a decrease, but not by very much. If you look at India, uh, it's gone up by 70% from, two, from the year 2000. That's 1.4 billion people. Uh, if you look at Pakistan, similar increase, maybe not by as much. And China sort of stands out relative to the rest of these lines because you see air pollution go up, and then sometime around 2011, it starts to go down. And that's, of course, when China's uh, war on air pollution started, and that's something that we're going to hear a lot about um, today. So with that, uh, let me hand off to, to Michael, who's going to walk us through the solutions and a lot more hope. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so Namrata is very difficult to follow, uh, as she knows is so clear and does such a great job. So as she said, uh, my job is to talk about uh, what has worked, and uh, this was really a terrific exercise putting together this talk, because I think it uh, caused certainly me, uh, probably she knew it all already, uh, to try and really think hard about well, what are the patterns that we have uh, seen across places. And so I'm going to start with, we'll have some uh, causal evidence from real experiments that are meant to be examples, but we're going to start with, I think, something that both of us came away from thinking about this and pulling this talk together, uh, believing that uh, you can be in a completely democratic country or, or a less democratic one or all kinds of political systems, but there really don't seem to be any instances that we were able to find uh, where countries made lots of progress on air pollution without very strong political will from the people. And so we're going to start with that uh, and just list uh, a couple examples that are especially famous. Uh, the UK uh, had this uh, very famous incident, the, the London fog in 1952, uh, and that seemed to have uh, metastasized in a particular way that led to lots of pushing for change, uh, and not long after that, the passage of the Cleaner Act, I'm going to give you a little more detail as we go along. The U.S., uh, there were a similar series of public events or catalyzing of uh, public demand for improvements in air quality. Uh, Initially, Rachel, uh, Rachel Carson's uh, fam very famous book, Silent Spring, published in 1962, uh, and eventually really massive demonstrations throughout the country uh, involving the initiation of Earth Day. Uh, and all of those started with the, it led to the first Cleaner Act, which was kind of toothless in 1963, uh, and then its subsequent amendments uh, in the early 70s and the passage of the EPA. What is often not recognized as a sidebar is uh, I, probably, I think it's safe to say that the greatest environmental president uh, in the United States history is Richard Nixon, who, uh, the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and uh, the EPA. Uh, and then there were a series of events, and uh, our, our, our next speaker is uh, certainly more informed than I am about this, uh, that appeared to precede and push uh, China into action on air pollution. Uh, some of that was coming from U.S. Embassy tweets that had hourly pollution concentrations in Beijing, uh, and there was widespread uh, public criticism in print uh, and social media, the Beijing mayor, uh, and all of that kind of led to uh, China's premier declaring a war on pollution in 2014. Uh, so here's just some pictures that are meant to illustrate each of those examples. This is, uh, since we're in London, it's irresistible to have the London smog or the London fog. Uh, some of the newspaper articles that followed from that. Here's Rachel Carson uh, testifying uh, before Congress in 1963. Uh, the 
masses of people uh, mobilizing for Earth Day and demanding uh, changes. A, a favorite story of mine, uh, Gary, Indiana, is uh, right next to Chicago. Uh, and in, as recently as the 1960s, or before the passage of all this legislation, it was commonplace that the white collar workers, uh, Robin has on a white shirt, uh, would bring a second shirt uh, because the first one was too dirty by the middle of the day. Uh, all of that has changed. Uh, and so Nixon, you can see here, is a great environmental president, proposed two new agencies. Uh, here are some pictures of what went on in China uh, and uh, the response that followed. So I think our conclusion, and this is not from a randomized control trial, uh, is uh, that widespread reporting and better understanding of pollution damages uh, have the potential to galvanize public opinion. And when that does, that can lead governments of all varieties uh, to act. Uh, and you know, if you wanted to trace it out in a kind of a recipe version, uh, here's our effort to do that. Uh, and it all ends with government enacting reforms. Air pollution is not something that uh, can be solved on the individual level. OK, so now we'll come to maybe maybe more comfortable territory. Uh, that's, I would call that a uh, theory of change. Uh, when people say they have a theory of change, it always makes me nervous. But that's kind of our theory of change. Uh, and now we'll retreat a little bit to more granular actions that governments take uh, in response to our grandiose theory of change. Uh, so one, uh, since we're at the London School of Economics, uh, one thing that you obviously must lead with is the you know, massive power of markets to efficiently uh, reduce air pollution. And there's lots of uh, evidence of that. Uh, the United States has used markets uh, in many, many settings, uh, lead gasoline, most famously probably in the SO2 markets, uh, the NOx market uh, as well. And the EU obviously has been a big user of markets uh, for CO2, and uh, the UK now has its own uh, CO2 program as well. Uh, these markets have been shown to greatly reduce air pollution of various kinds, uh, and to do that at relatively low cost. Uh, here's a, the famous picture from Schmalzi and Stevens' work about uh, SO2 demonstrating how uh, pollution marched right down uh, with the cap, as you would expect it to do if it was enforced. Uh, I think an interesting question that we didn't have an answer to, and hopefully now we have a partial answer from some of my own work, is are these markets useful in all the places that are on the map that Namrata put up uh, where there's high levels of uh, air pollution? Uh, and so the, I'm going to just zoom by uh, a randomized control trial that we, uh, and uh, Anant Sudarshan, who's here, uh, Nick Ryan and Rohini Pandey and I, ran to test exactly uh, this idea. Uh, and the idea was India has this very well-developed command and control style of regulation for air pollution. Could you run a horse race where you randomly assign some plants uh, to be regulated through the market and some the standard way? Uh, what, what, what would happen? Uh, and it's just worth highlighting, although this is not a usual thing that people focus on uh, in the evaluation markets, uh, this is also super labor saving uh, and super, I don't know, better living, pleasant living uh, for the regulators. So here's an example of how the regulators, uh, in the status quo, uh, they have to, climb, to take readings a couple times a year. They'll go to a plant like this that has a stack like that. They'll climb up on that scary thing. Uh, they'll stick a probe in there. Uh, that probe basically has a thimble attached to it. Uh, it's in there for 30 minutes. The thimble gets uh, sent to the lab. You weigh how heavy the thimble is before it went in and uh, how heavy it was after. And, you know, voila, you have a measurement. And that's like a pretty painful way to go about uh, figuring out air pollution. The alternative, uh, which is super labor saving, is to just stick this probe on the side. And then instead of getting a reading for two 30 minute periods per year, you can have a minute or 15 second by 15 second reading uh, continuously. And so this kind of measurement, uh, although that was not the focus of our study, I think is the backbone of uh, effective regulation. Uh, and so just to get to the punchline, uh, the plants who were in the treatment group and were now subject to, command, uh, to uh, applying to a, a market 
uh, we're really, really very, very quickly figured out how the, this new concept of trading pollution worked. Uh, it turns out that when money's on the line, people uh, are able to think very clearly. Uh, and uh, so that wasn't hard to make happen. Uh, and our headline findings were that there was a roughly 12% uh, reduction in industry's compliance costs uh, and a very large reduction uh, in pollution emissions as the regulator found it less and less expensive uh, to introduce uh, tighter standards on the treatment group. Uh, and if you did a cost-benefit analysis, you would end up with some crazy number like this, that the benefits of regulation uh, of a cap and trade market are about 200 times uh, the cost in these, so like, you know, well beyond worrying about decimal places. Um, a second way uh, that is also probably comes from using economics glasses is trying to find uh, the incentives of the various actors who participate uh, in the production of pollution and see if you could uh, rejigger them uh, in a way that would uh, produce better outcomes. Uh, and so we have, uh, here there's going to, we have a couple examples. Uh, one is that in, in, in the state of Gujarat, plants have to get inspected uh, by third party auditors. Uh, when we started working with them, the plants got to choose their auditor and got to pay their auditor. Uh, and it doesn't take a PhD from the LSE to think, oh, maybe there's something so, not quite so hot about that. And so what you could see is that all the plants are being reported as being in compliance. Uh, they're all to the left of the red line. Uh, except for a few stragglers who somehow couldn't pay the auditor the right amount of money. Uh, and what's really interesting is uh, that these are the reports that the regulator got, uh, but we had a second set of people, college students, go in and take measurements on their own uh, that were not for, had no regulatory bearing. Uh, and what we found is that was wholly different. Uh, and so indeed, uh, the auditors who were facing incentives not to tell the truth, we're not telling the truth. Uh, and so we devised an experiment to free the auditors from the tyranny of the plants who uh, demanded particular results. Uh, and that led to uh, very truthful, uh, much closer to truthful reporting. Uh, and in, most importantly, uh, it caused the plants who now knew that the regulator was seeing the truth uh, to reduce their emissions, and that's the last point here, by about 28%. Uh, and so, by getting into the inner workings of the incentives of various actors, that's another way uh, that you can, in a more granular way, uh, reduce pollution. Uh, this is uh, from Namrata's work. It's uh, always dangerous to present someone else's work in front of them. Uh, but they have, uh, you know, this really amazing fact, which is, uh, so, so uh, that there's lots of crop burning that goes on uh, in northern India every year. They have this amazing fact that Burning 50 acres causes it, uh, every 50 acres causes an additional death. Uh, and this uh, crop burning, if you've ever been in India or Pakistan at this time of year, it's like almost makes uh, the environment dystopian uh, and everyone is complaining about it and no one can get the farmers to stop doing it. Uh, and so what they came up with uh, was an experiment uh, where there's a true control group uh, one set of farmers who weren't offered a contract and weren't, didn't receive any payments. A second who were offered a contract conditional on proof uh, that they didn't burn. Uh, and the third group, or the second treatment group, where farmers were offered an unconditional partial upfront payment with the remaining balance given af uh, after verification of compliance. Uh, and the very striking result uh, is that the standard approach where you only pay people ex post, that's Mr. Purple there, I think, uh, did not actually do anything relative to the control group, but the up bundle, having some of the payment come up front uh, had this very large impact on uh, increasing compliance with the no burning, uh, with, the, with, with the no burning goals. Uh, and, you know, they also have uh, some amazing cost-benefit analysis uh, that the mortality damage is about 150 to 230 times the per acre cost of reducing burning through this upfront uh, payment for environmental services. So this is another example of, like, if you can, and what, one thing I really appreciate about this paper is 
uh, getting the context right and understanding the incentives uh, of the various actors. Um, uh, this is from some work of mine uh, with Shauda, uh, who's here today, uh, and I don't have time to go into great detail, but uh, it's from China where uh, when we randomly assigned making uh, very public, both to the regulator and the public, that plants were violating uh, their pollution standards, uh, that led to increased enforcement effort uh, by the government uh, as well as very large reductions in uh, pollution from the, uh, from the plants. And that, that too is an example of trying to find uh, what the incentives of the actors were, in this case, uh, the government officials. Um, so that's, uh, th that's our collection of things that have worked. And then the last category, we thought about weaving this throughout, and I'm hoping this will be something that we can talk about uh, on, on the panel, is a whole series of things that happened in China. Uh, and which, I, I, let me just say from the outset, what China has achieved uh, since declaring a war on pollution in 2013, there is no historical precedent for that in any of the other countries uh, that we've looked at in terms of there have been comparable reductions in pollution, but always over a period of two to three decades. This was accomplished in seven or eight years uh, and it is, it is ongoing, but the rate uh, the, the, the rate at which this change has happened and the depth or the in, decrease uh, in air pollution is really uh, without uh, pr uh, historical precedent. Uh, and here's some facts, and I, I think our next presenter is going to have more detail on it. But And they did just a whole wild suite of policies, uh, prohibitions on new coal plants, mandated emissions reductions or the replacements for existing plants, uh, the whole winter heating system, which Namrata talked about uh, before, was run on coal. They just wholesale ripped that out uh, and uh, replaced it with uh, natural gas. Uh, and uh, a kind of series of things that like policymakers in other countries might think about, but I think would often have a very, very difficult time uh, implementing, particularly in such a short period of time. Uh, the, my, my work with Shouda uh, takes advantage of a national uh, continuous emissions monitoring system, uh, and uh, it is also true that the uh, government officials, their promotion standards began to, uh, this is about getting the incentives right, uh, began to be based on what was going on with uh, pollution. Okay, uh, so let me just try and conclude. Uh, you know, the air pollution problem, it's kind of a joke every time you see a new paper on the health or other impacts of air pollution uh, is like every day uh, there's yet some new evidence on ways in which air pollution compromises human well-being. Uh, I think that is often uh, underappreciated, uh, particularly in the shadow of uh, climate change. Uh, but as Namrata pointed out, uh, there are billions of people on the planet uh, who are experiencing really extraordinary levels uh, of air pollution, and that's showing up in sicker and shorter lives, reduced productivity, uh, and a uh, variety of other metrics of uh, human well-being, all pointing in the wrong direction. Uh, the second big point that we took away from this, putting this together, uh, is that there are really a series of countries that have been able to make very, very large improvements uh, in air quality. So it's not a law of physics that air pollution has to be bad if you get rich uh, or if you get industrialized. It's a choice. Uh, and when countries have chosen to do something about it, there's a lot of uh, evidence uh, of that work. Uh, and then uh, probably our safe zone uh, is the granular studies on uh, how people go about uh, achieving that. So uh, with that, let me turn the stage over uh, to our next speaker. So hello, everyone. My name is Liu Xin. I come from Energy Function China, mainly in charge of the uh, environmental management program and 
tell you. Before that, I worked for the Beijing Municipal Environmental Protection Bureau for more than 15 years, mainly focused on the air quality management. So I, I may have uh, multiple angles towards air pollution control. So uh, it's my honor to be here to uh, present my uh, slides and uh, try to learn more from you. So basically the story is that uh, I think uh, Michael and uh, Namrata already introduced a lot about China's story, so my job is easier. So basically the story is that uh, China government uh, pay much attention to meet uh, people's uh, increasing uh, desire for uh, higher demand for better life. So basically about 12 years ago, when the severe air pollution became a very, uh, very important uh, how to say, uh, environmental and uh, social even the political issues, the central government uh, paid much attention to that and released the national air quality standards with PM25 as a certified micrograph micrometer. It's like the most loose uh, limit of WHO's guideline at that time. Then after that, uh, the three consecutive uh, national air, air quality management action plans uh, were released and implemented. The first uh, action plan mainly focused on PM25 uh, from 2013 to 2017, and the second one focused on the both PM25 and ozone. Ozone is an invisible uh, pollutant. And, uh, the currently the ongoing the third uh, period we focus on the air pollution and the GG synergy, synergy uh, which the emitting heavily pollution, diesel truck control, and auto pollution control were prioritized. So this is basically the significant progress in structure adjustment, including energy structure transition, industrial structure transition, and transportation structure transition. I just want to highlight first, the coal consumption reached the plateau since 2012, and uh, I think that based, uh, mainly because of the strict, stringent uh, air quality management action plan. And uh, we also uh, conduct uh, the clean heating uh, actions in the rural areas to, re to release, a, to uh, eliminate uh, scattered coal. And I think uh, Michael just introduced that case and uh, face, face out a lot of uh, small coal-fired power plants. And for the transportation, we have an integrated solution to reduce the, the vehicles and uh, change the transportation structure from the, like, uh, the, the road to rail and ships to reduce the bulk, uh, bulk, uh, buckle and the, 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 from the diesel trucks, and the, for the new energy, uh, new EV, the electric vehicles, increased uh, about uh, 40 million, uh, 12 million uh, cars, and uh, the meanwhile also uh, eliminate more than 40 million old cars. And uh, besides that, we also uh, establish a science-based monitoring, analysis, and decision supporting system including the monitoring network and the integrated uh, three-dimensional observation system, including like airplane, the meteorological uh, balloon, and uh, laser radar, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, multi-level air quality forecasting and early warning system, and a science-based uh, planning system, including the inventory, source apportionment, ta tailored action plan. And besides that, I think, uh, Michael just uh, highlighted that uh, China has a very powerful regulation or command control uh, system. So from the central government to the local government, we have the supervision system and the regional uh, coordination mechanism to tackle regional transport pollution and the local tailor implementation plans. For example, Beijing mayor, who may be the, the most powerful person in that in the city, who, uh, he takes the lead on the air pollution control. And we have uh, the very strict uh, regulation and uh, incentive policies. 
And uh, so after all of these measures were implemented, I think uh, all of the uh, uh, criteria pollutant emissions decreased drastically. So we can see uh, by uh, 2020, actually, the, all of the six criteria pollutants meet the standard. In 2022, uh, like PM2O5 uh, is lower than uh, 30 microgram per kilometer. So it's a, a huge uh, progress. And meanwhile, this slide also shows that uh, we, we achieved the, the decoupled from the economic development and uh, the air pollution control, especially with those uh, uh, the energy, uh, the economy that uh, is uh, supported by the coal-related industries. It means that uh, we achieved the win-win solution from economic development and the environmental improvement. And we also achieved a huge health benefits uh, compared to uh, 2013. The long-term and the short-term uh, health uh, uh, exposure level reduced by 20 and 40 percent, and the short-term exposure is higher just because we, uh, we also focused on the like, uh, heavy pollution weather in winter by, uh, by uh, implementing the uh, clean, we, clean heating uh, action plan. And also the air pollution measures uh, achieved the very significant co-benefit for CO2 emission reductions. So in the past uh, about 10 years, the air pollution measures achieved about uh, 2.43 gigatons due to CO2 uh, accumulatively and in which the phasing out outdated industrial capacity, abrogating on industrial boilers and promoting clean fuels in residential sectors uh, are the third, the most important measures. So we also conduct cost benefit analysis showing that uh, in the 13th five year plan, we have a huge uh, benefit and the benefit, the rate of benefit to cost is 1.4. In the ongoing uh, 14th five year plan, we have less uh, the benefit. I think just because the, uh, I think uh, we, uh, it's harder to achieve the same speed of air quality improvement compared to five years ago, but the, the rate increased, I think uh, is uh, a very interesting result. Maybe we can discuss it later. And this is the similar, uh, uh, story in Beijing. And the Beijing is just, I think, uh, learn a lot from uh, the experience of London. And uh, I think 10 years ago, we have uh, more than 30 million tons of uh, coal uh, use. But currently, uh, Beijing is kind of a, a coal-free city, less than like uh, 1 million tons of coal. So basically, the PM25 reached the uh, air quality standard. We also achieved the ozone attainment. And these measures brought uh, about 20% uh, of uh, GG emission reductions after the peaking in 2012. So for the next stage, we think uh, China should uh, do more on synergy of air quality improvement and GG reductions from more synergistic targets and optimize uh, uh, sectoral emission reduction pathways and you know, innovative technology measures and more effective uh, investment finance uh, mechanism and the stringent uh, regulatory framework to integrate uh, GG into current uh, air quality system. And meanwhile, we, tr we try to achieve a comprehensive uh, air quality improvement to s by setting new goals and uh, health-based standards. For example, the PM25 is still the biggest uh, 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 health impact contributor, but ozone is getting worse. So how to deal with that? And uh, our air quality standard is not uh, uh, as, as stringent as uh, like WHO's guideline or US or UK's uh, standard. So we need to tighten up that. And uh, we also need to improve assessment method to try to uh, achieve the clean air for everyone. So. Energy Foundation China, we set our air quality strategy 
And the long-term vision is to achieve the world-class air quality and the, the safe climate and the sustainable economy development. So basically, we think by 2050, uh, by implementing synergistic air pollution control and the GG emission reduction action plans, we can achieve the uh, PM25 uh, lower than 10 uh, micrograms per meter, ozone lower than uh, uh, 100 micrograms per meter, and achieve the, the carbon neutrality. And we, do the, uh, we did the analysis for if we achieve that uh, uh, air quality improvement goals, I think we can prevent uh, at most uh, 3.7 million premature deaths compared to the uh, BAU scenarios, considering uh, China is in the fast uh, aging process. So basically, this is a huge uh, health benefits for our synergy of air pollution and the GG reduction action plans. So that's it all. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Umar Masood. I'm the uh, chief executive officer of the Urban Unit. Uh, I'm following China, so it's a tough act to follow. Uh, uh, so the war on air, air pollution, uh, well, you know, these, uh, these slides are quite common. Uh, it's a uh, visual of Lahore on a clear day and on a smog-filled day. Uh, how is Lahore doing? Uh, well, we at the Urban Unit, we call it the fifth season of smog, so any of one of you who is a Netflix fan uh, would, would really know it's, it's like season after season. And, uh, and, and we, we are really uh, doing very well as far as getting right on the top five uh, most uh, polluted cities in the world. Nothing to be proud of, uh, but uh, you know, Narmata pointed out, Residents of Lahore would gain 7.5 years if WHO standards are met. So that's, uh, that's even longer than I took uh, completing my uh, you know, PhD. So you know, that's, that's, that's significant. Uh, that's, that's really significant. So uh, uh, you know, this slide is from the urban unit's own monitoring system. It's on our rooftop. Uh, this is from, I think, March 2021. And you can see October, February are really October, February, November, January, the winter months are the worst months. But the most striking thing is that the blue line right at the bottom that you see, anything below the blue line are the good quality days. And we just had five good quality days since May 2021. So even the rain and the monsoons and the wind patterns just does not bring us under 50. So this is a major challenge. Uh, we sort of tiptoed into data as far as uh, emission was concerned. I call it a case to ponder. Uh, so this is in 2023. Uh, this was all based on secondary data, basically IPCC tier one analysis using an emission factor. And we said we really need to put something out of what is causing, uh, you know, pollution on, uh, in Lahore. And this is what we came up with. So transport according to our study or our assessment, our calculation, uh, came out right, out the, right on the top. It was 88, 83.15%. Industries was only 9.7%. And I can tell you that this uh, report or study was not well received within government, especially the transport department. We are still, uh, you know, sort of being summoned every day in trying to explain that why we did not use primary data, what was our sources of secondary data, when we tell them that it was their secondary data that they were using, so that's, uh, that's another thing. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is, uh, you know, data and anal analytics is all good, but when it comes to policy implementation or enforcement, it, it sometimes create good, it creates good pressure and sometimes it creates really negative pressure. So all of a sudden the transport secretary feels 
that he is 88%, 83% responsible for the smog situation. And this is what he told me over the phone. He says, I'm not responsible for that, but your report is making me sound that I'm responsible for that. So that's a major issue of policy. So we sort of broke it down for him and we said, yes, you are the, uh, you know, you're right at the top, but when it comes to PM 2.5, agriculture crop burning, direct PM 2.5 is 371. From transport, direct PM 2.5 is 397. But we have to keep in mind right at the top uh, that uh, the NOx index, which is basically, uh, you know, gases which are uh, emitted through fossil fuel burning, they combine in the atmosphere to actually create more PM 2.5. Uh, so uh, while you might not say that directly transport is uh, affecting uh, the PM 2.5, but uh, transport does affect the secondary uh, creation of, you know, 2.5. Um, and this was their, uh, the state reactions. Skeptical to take ownership of data and dispute percentage emission share. They, they are still demanding re-evaluation. We'll do it for them. And the, now they have started asking the federal government for a more holistic approach. So that's a, that's a slate of hand, you know, um, um, in bureaucracy, um, we, I'm well mastered in the dark arts of these things. So, uh, um, you know, how do you diverge or, you know, deflect something, you, you, you go to the federal government. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's a way of doing things. But uh, we mapped it out. So how do you sort of, if, if a war on air pollution, this is the war, we've got a battlefront the transport sector. So uh, if the theater is the city of Lahore, what can we actually do about it? We, we talk about three factors, the vehicle efficiency, the fuel content, and vehicle miles traveled. So all these three things contribute to greater emissions and greater PM 2.5. And if you look at vehicle efficiencies, higher Euro engine, inspection regime, the policy for electric vehicle, two wheelers, because these are affordable, that rests with the federal government. Fuel content is really interesting because, you know, if you add a high octane, and this is what we are asking for, that you, you need to have a high octane fuel, but then you need to also have a higher euro engine. So the manufacturers actually come into play. So unless they have a higher euro engine, you simply cannot go with a higher octane content because uh, the in engine efficiency would, uh, would uh, start getting affected. So these were uh, sort of more complicated issues. It involves the federal government, but look at the bottom when we come to vehicle miles travel. Traffic engineering management, more non-motorized last minute access like sidewalks, et cetera, public transit oriented development. These are the things which local governments can do. And I think if this is the battlefront, this is my strategy. I'll rather start at the bottom of how to start, uh, you know, uh, curbing down on transport sector emissions. Uh, I'll not go through this exhaustive uh, list. Uh, we are already with half an hour to go. But uh, we have a slow and un unresponsive land use planning approach to climate adaption, especially with reference to land use. We never look at land use of what its impact would be as far as emissions is concerned. Government pr uh, priorities are focused on the road infrastructure, and then there is this lack of collaboration between different government departments. The road organization is separate from the traffic organizations. Um, and I've already uh, uh, talked about petroleum standards, no clear planning for non-motorized transport and traffic engineering. Uh, let's move forward. Uh, this is uh, a replay of the slide which I did, like, did a couple of hours ago. But three and four are really important when it comes to uh, air quality and war on air pollution. We really need to have a criteria for different policy outcomes which is missing. We really need to set a target for ourselves. I think in, in the case of Lahore, if it is 7.5 years, can we reduce it? Can we half it? When are we going to half it? So these, these type of target, uh, this type of target setting is really required. Uh, right now it's a very, um, very amorphous type of, a, you know, situation, there is a lot of discussion, but there is no, uh, no direction or no traction. And what Michael really just pointed out is, is there a political will? Well, I think two years ago there was COVID. 
and there was political will. People went for masks. People, uh, you know, made all sort of sacrifices, work from home, and this was happening in Lahore, the city of Lahore, in Pakistan also. So how was political will created at that time, and can we actually sort of frame it in, in, in such a way to make it a political question? Framing is important, and new data is creating comp complexity or adding simplicity. I just spoke about it moments ago. Uh, we are not looking at industry, and we have not really, really talked about it. I, I understand there will be another public lecture on greening of industry, so I would not, not like to steal the thunder from them. So, But uh, uh, the idea is that 95% of manufacturing and engineering is small and medium scale based. Uh, and this is from a study which the Pakistan Institute of Development Economics did this year. I mean, these are the attitude of the 375 firms that they were surveyed, uh, that were surveyed. Lack of professionalism, little is enough mindset which inhibits SME firms to grow. The whole idea is that how are they going to invest in clean technologies if this is the type of attitudes and mindsets which we are actually getting from the survey. Uh, but there is a success story. And while it did not take decades, it took years, and that is the Bricklands. This is also a small and medium enterprise. This is not very high-end technically, so the entrepreneurs which are running them are not really cutting-edge innovators, but they were able to convert 8,000 Bricklands to uh, zigzag clean technology which uh, reduced carbon emission by 60%, bought them 30% saving. The payback of this technology uh, was faster. It took about, uh, I think, in uh, about 3 million rupees to install this technology per uh, Bricklin, and this was two years ago. So 3 million would convert to something like 20,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, uh, but the most interesting phenomena, if you look at the right-hand side, Yes, the right-hand side of the, um, of the slide is that this was integrated. I did not know about it even um, you know, a week ago, that there was an international center for integrated mountain development which copied this technology from Nepal and brought it over into Pakistan. At the national level or at the federal level, it was taken over by the Na National Energy and Efficiency Conservation Authority. The provincial EPD department took it over and then we involved the Bricklins and Bricklin owners. And how did we involve them? We involved them by declaring smog as a national disaster. And under the disaster, if you declare something as a disaster, all rules and regulations sort of soften up. You know, you can th uh, do things very quickly. So there was a framework available, some bright sort of civil servant thought about it, Let, let's declare it to be a provincial disaster. So this was given to the Provincial Disaster Management Authority, which was able to then um, convince the Bricklin owners on how to sort of start introducing this technology to reduce uh, you know, carbon emissions. And this is it. Uh, this is my last slide. And over to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Terrific. So I'd like to uh, start by thanking all of our panelists for such uh, fascinating and, and informative uh, presentations. We're going to allow plenty of time towards the end for audience Q&A, but we're going to start off this part of the session by uh, sort of trying to have as, as interactive a conversation between the panelists on the important sets of issues uh, that have been uh, raised here. So I'll, I'll sort of start that off with a, a question to... To, to all the panelists, but perhaps, uh, Eugene, you could kick us off on this. Many of the presentations have highlighted some of the, uh, the really enormous uh, successes of, of China's recent, recent policy in, in this area, and I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on, on you know, how far this re reflects uh, uh, elements of the context that are our special case versus perhaps more, uh, hopefully, um, the sorts of lessons that uh, might be drawn from China's recent policy experience that are relevant to other, other contexts. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, China is the biggest uh, the developing country with a lot of uh, population. And uh, we have a very diversified uh, uh, different uh, development, uh, economic development levels. For example, we have the 
very uh, modern city, Beijing, Shanghai, and also the very uh, uh, undeveloped areas in the Midwest. So I think uh, China's experience can shared by different countries in the world. And meanwhile, I think China, we, our vision is to, how to say, serve the, serve the people. We are the People's Republic of China, right? So I think uh, the, success, the success is based on the government uh, how to say, put uh, the people's uh, increasing desire for a better life as uh, their first priority. And uh, I think that during the past uh, uh, 10 years, we are in a very relatively stable uh, political environment and uh, a good economic uh, uh, circle. So I think we have the political willingness and we have the enough uh, funding to support this uh, uh, air pollution control. And also like uh, Michael said, and uh, since China already released all of the let's say uh, real-time air quality data and uh, the emission sources data, so the public uh, uh, let's say supervision is also very powerful tools for the government to implement their responsibilities. And so I think uh, this is uh, 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 people's war need to, how to say, love the people, bad the people, for the people, and also need the airlines contribution. So, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, perhaps Michael or Namrata jump in based on the uh, uh, experience working on this and, and reviewing this for the presentation today, if you've got reflections on that. I, I just, you know, I'll just point out, I think China's uh, experiences, there is no historical precedent for achieving such large reductions in such a short period of time. And uh, I think that is both a hope uh, for the world, but I, I also struck by uh, the efficiency of the Chinese political system when it puts its mind to something uh, and left one, you know, personally left wondering the degree to which it does apply uh, in, in other places. Or you could uh, from Pakistan's perspective. You know, uh, uh, when we uh, compare ourselves to China, I'm, I'm talking from the Pakistani perspective. Uh, we do not compare it as an impossibility because uh, not in the very distant past, you know, China was facing the same problems which Pakistan was, and in some cases they were uh, more severe in nature. So, so the idea, you know, the achievements of China are really a beacon of hope that we can also do it. Whether we do it the way China has done it, you know, that is, that is a big question mark. But, you know, the, the emphasis on China, because many Pakistanis travel to China, have been traveling to China for many, many years, and they actually come us and tell us that, you know, in 2005 when I visited China, you know, it was all smog and it was, you know, it was difficult to breathe. Now that I go over there, it's a totally different place. And, and both Pakistani policymakers and the Pakistani public sort of accepts it that if they can do it, then we can do it. Obviously, you know, uh, the two political systems are actually much different and we have to sort of figure out a way uh, looking at other models that, you know, if this is what China has been able to do, we might not be able to do 100% of China, but, you know, there is a lot of room for improvement, so as to speak. Uh, so, uh, you know, the bar for us is, is lower than China, but it is something that we, sh we need to sort of clear. I think it's a pure sort of conjecture and reflection as opposed to, like, here's causal evidence on this. I think from what some of what it looks like China has done in terms of its success, I think are maybe things that other developing countries should be taking up the mantle of. So when we think about, um, so Michael, your co-authored work shows mm. that air quality regulation in India you know, has bite when it's enforced, and I think that's, that's hopeful. Um, I think that trying to incentivize public officials mm. on environmental quality um, India 
over time has been incentivizing state-owned enterprises to be more efficient. So I think there's maybe some uh, precedence for something like that, and I think that that's something that we could learn from. There's green shoots of environmental markets, and I think maybe that's um, another thing that, that we could learn from. Um, I do think that it has to be preceded by the political will uh, aspect of this. So I think I'm going to split the difference here a little bit where I see things that I think are things that maybe South Asian countries could learn from and do and have been doing to some extent already. Yes, uh, you know, uh, I just gave the example of Britlins, but when I was uh, sort of preparing for that, uh, you know, I came across, because it was the first time that I started looking at the firm sector or the industrial sector, and I, it's hard to imagine, but all our export-oriented firms are actually seeking Chinese expertise on how to make them go green. So there was, there's a lot of backward engineering happening, retrofitting of plants. I think that is one thing, the firm level experiences that we really need to sort of look at. Well, the transport sector is obviously one, one big area of concern, but when we look at uh, our export-oriented firms, you know, every time sort of we saw an example in which they are trying to curb emissions or, uh, you know, improve air quality, from where did they get this idea and from where are they getting the expertise? They are inviting the Chinese over on how to do it as quickly as, you know, um, possible because obviously their expertise uh, is nearby. Most possibly it's also cheaper, uh, you know, and, and, and they are quite, you know, liberal with sort of imparting that, uh, you know, learning to our firms. So that is uh, important. Hey, hey, can I ask you one question? I was just fascinated by uh, your experiences. Uh, what, uh, you had this complicated conversation with the transport department. Mm -hmm. uh, now, is there, you know, what would have had to have happened for you not to have had that complicated conversation? So, you know, suppose that we're on the front page of the newspapers uh, and there was Twitter, which I guess we call X now. Uh, you know, how much of that would allowed you to have had a different conversation with the transport department? Michael Greenstone, if you had signed that report, I think I would never have had that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's it really, um, <laughs> perhaps we I could use that as a segue into a, a related set of questions, very topical in the UK here at the moment with the expansion of, of London's low emission zone, which is the role of public perceptions mm. on, on air pollution policy. Mm. And perhaps you could talk a little bit uh, across the panel about your, your experience with the role of public perceptions in policy making on this set of topics, what can be done to shift that? I think we are not asking the public whether this is a matter of concern, you know. Uh, uh, again, you know, this is a very, very important question. There is an assumption that the public is not concerned about clean air. There is an assumption in our policy making mind, they are not. But hang on for a minute. Um, you know, when we ask, when these surveys are done, we ask them about water and sanitation. They have, that's very high on their priority list. So how is water and sanitation very high on the priority list? And how can we assume that air quality is not high on the priority list? Because the, during the winter season, the number of people which are hospitalized of all age groups because of, uh, you know, breathing difficulty, um, difficulty, uh, uh, respiratory ailments, and the cost of medical treatment, that is really taking a toll. And, you know, uh, people are complaining about it, not because they are suffering from air pollution, because the treatment from air pollution is costing them a lot. So, you know, air pollution or clean air or PM 2.5, is, is an issue. It's, it's simply that we, the government side has not really framed it as a public issue. And it, it should not be difficult to frame it as a public issue. And to Michael's point, if that had been a public issue, the Secretary of Transport would have been less skeptical about the report and would have said that, okay, if this is a public issue, I'll sort of go along with it and work out a, a, you know, a strategy for it. That's it. Well, where we need to leave time for the audience, but I wonder if you could just say something about the, the experience in China on the role of the, the, the role of, of uh, public perception uh, on of air pollution or air pollution policy. 
Uh, I think uh, the public uh, is uh, very satisfied with uh, what the uh, uh, government uh, did for the uh, air quality improvement. And uh, I think uh, this is uh, the, the institutional advantage of China and uh, the public uh, have a deep uh, trust into the government. So I think in the past uh, 10 years, the president did uh, two uh, very good things. One is air pollution control, another is uh, to control the, how to say, corruption. So I think both of these things That's are two similar things to dig the deep uh, reasons and uh, to find the sources of these, uh, how to say, pollution sources and uh, corruption sources and find out and control it. So I think that's why peop, uh, the public have the confidence to, uh, to the government. And uh, I think uh, currently it's uh, more difficult because of economic trend, but uh, uh, I think the government will stay together with the public to work together for the air pollution. Great. So thank you very much. We could continue this discussion uh, for a long time, I know, but I'm keen to hear from members of the audience um, with questions for the panel. If I could remind you to please uh, uh, give your name and your organizational affiliation before you ask your question. Um, I'm going to take questions in groups of three. Tim, do we have any from online? Okay. So do you want to, while the stewards will come to you with a microphone, do you want to uh, read out some of those? Yes. So these online questions continue the vein on public perceptions. So the there's a pair of questions on transportation. So number one, how effective have low emission zones been in bringing down air pollution levels? Number two, uh, what are the net benefits of electrical vehicles in reducing total air pollution? And then the third question from online relates to whether there is a risk that regulation to combat pollution might come at the cost of industrial development. Okay, so why don't we take those while perhaps the, the microphones make their way towards uh, uh, members of the audience. Can I uh, take on the uh, industrial development one? Uh, so there are specialized settings, uh, actually India is one, uh, where you can actually have the super rare win-win uh, where you actually reduce compliance costs uh, and improve environmental quality, but that's only a function of having uh, reform against uh, very clunky command and control uh, regulation being in place. But in general, there is absolutely a trade-off uh, between economic growth uh, and environmental quality. Uh, and But what is like jumps off, like the, I don't know if Namrata felt this way, but I was almost embarrassed to put up some of the cost-benefit analyses uh, because they look like we've cooked the numbers in some weird way. Uh, and But the, what the point is that the benefits so vastly exceed uh, the costs, particularly at the very high concentrations that prevail in the parts of the world that we've spent uh, a lot of time talking about. So uh, yes, there's a cost, uh, but uh, you know, life is filled with trade-offs, and the trade-off here is enormous benefits against relatively small costs. Do you want to pick up on the industrial policy points or take on the, the thorny issues of uh, low emission zones or, or EVs there? Uh, EVs, yes. Uh, without even going into the numbers, and I don't have the numbers for it, what is the benefit of an EV? So let me give you a real life situation. The two wheeler fossil fuel burning motorbike, which they are going to replace has a two-stroke engine and which, uh, which sort of emits the highest amount of nitrogen oxide, which then combines in the atmosphere to, uh, uh, to make more PM2.5 and uh, you know, PM10 or something like that. Uh, but if you replace it with an EV motorbike, uh, the only problem is the affordability or the initial cost of it. That thing just reduces itself to a zero. Uh, almost, almost, to, so 300% uh, increase in mot motorbike registration in the last decade in the city of Lahore. And these are motorbikes which middle to low income groups who could afford cheaper motorbikes and ironically they were being also imported from China initially and then they actually set up their plants uh, there in Pakistan. Uh, so the whole idea was that there was not a public transport system, so the cheap but polluting motorbike became the favorite 
sort of uh, mode of travel. Now, if that is replaced by an EV two vehicle policy, uh, if that is sort of cleverly crafted, the 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 effect as far as emission was concerned would be drastic. It would be, and 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 Michael is right. You know, you just look. Even if you were to put a bar graph, uh, you you would not be able to see the bar of the EV as far as the you know type of emissions is concerned. Uh, that is not an issue. The issue is basically the affordability and the financing of that vehicle and the charging and the battery of it. That is more of an issue. Yes. So I think just to kind of strongly agree with what Michael said about clearly, I did not do a good enough job pointing out how very very bad air pollution is. Um, and all of the damages that it causes, but I will work on that. And the returns are just really high of cleaning the air. I think on EVs, the, I'll just make the really obvious but sometimes forgotten point that the returns to EVs in terms of pollution reduction depends on what the grid uh, is powered by. And so feeding EVs electricity from coal, not good. Uh, but so it has to be accompanied by just cleaning up the grid as well. Thank you. Perhaps, if, unless you want to uh, Can I answer say something. The Absolutely. The yep. And then we'll question. turn to the next set of three. Right. Okay. I would love to answer the first question about uh, the impact uh, or the effects of a uh, low emission zone. I think uh, uh, China, especially Beijing, learn a lot from the advanced uh, countries like London. I think London has a bunch of experience on uh, to use uh, low emission zones, and we also learn that. I think uh, about 10 years ago, I, I came here for the first time and I learned a lot about how to, how to set a sticker and uh, use camera to, to capture the, the vehicles and to give them some different fee to, how to say, uh, reduce uh, the emissions. And uh, uh, in Beijing, we also have a, a, a lot of new uh, measures, for example, for the uh, light uh, diesel vehicles. We are not allowed them to use in, in the like the six ring, it, mainly in the most of the uh, Beijing areas, and for the like rush hour, uh, we don't uh, allow the how to say the high emitting uh, uh, pollution cars to drive into these low emission zones. Otherwise, they will get a ticket, and uh, also we have some like uh, uh, five days uh, policies. I think you may. On us already know that every day, every working day, we have a uh, two, uh, two plate numbers. will stop, stop drive, something like that. But uh, I think it's a equal uh, policy for everyone. And Terrific. yeah. Terrific. Thank you very much. So if we could just see the show of hands, we've got uh, a couple of questions here, and then uh, one at the front. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. I'm Cabby, a Masters of Health Health Policy student here at the LSE. Um, my question actually relates to framing. Um, so I know a couple of the panelists brought that up throughout the presentations, and it actually relates to framing within a health context. I noticed mm -hmm. throughout the presentation on a lot of the ways that you were explaining how impactful these pollution pollutants are is through a health lens, like the health consequences of that, consequences to a healthcare system, consequences on life expectancy, that kind of thing. I was just wondering, like, what thought process kind of goes into that? If anything, is that just the best metric available? Do you think that's the most persuasive? Um, and also, do you think framing it in that way as almost a health issue is effective in convincing the public that this is something to be taken seriously? Great, thank you. Uh, one just behind, if I could just ask a uh, question, ask us to be as concise as possible, yeah. just so we make sure we uh, have time for, for everyone. So this is just a question for Michael and, uh, uh, and Namrata's framing. So you spoke about China as a sort of optimistic example in the context of political will, but what China is doing today, it did not do 30 years ago, and it's a much richer country today. So why wouldn't the takeaway from China be that when South Asia gets much richer, it can do what China did today. Thank you. And then a uh, question at the front of the microphone could make its way here. Brilliant. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sari Mohammed, and I am from Islamabad, Pakistan. So my question is directed to Dr. Omar. How do you believe transport pollution can be countered in Lahore? If you could just give out a few points. Thank you so much. Great. So I think the first couple of those may be for you, Natasha, and then maybe we could turn to Tamara. Uh, yeah. 
So first, I think part of this discussion has been like, what can we learn from China's war on air pollution? Um, and I think we pointed out some of the things that it, at least India has already tried, like stringent air pollution regulation, and that has worked and that has saved lives. So I think like, I wouldn't say, let's do exactly this. I don't think it's possible. I don't know that we should be doing all of this. Uh, but here's some parallels that we could perhaps uh, learn from. I think, as Michael pointed out in his talk, when we were looking at successful examples, um, you know, the U.S. was rich a month before Rachel Carson came uh, with her book and said something. And you know, the, the U.K. Was, was just as rich like the year before it started these uh, air quality regulations because the smog uh, led to large health effects. So I think what struck us as being perhaps interesting about and educational about all of these episodes were that the public like cared a lot more about this um, and that led to political will. In fact, I think there's a new paper that talks about how just air quality monitoring increases the public's um, demand for, for clean air. And I think that's po pointing to this story as well. So I think certainly wealth is, is one uh, dimension on which we think the, that political will will count on. But as we pointed out, it's just large amounts of air pollution and salience about the health effects of that uh, struck us as being quite important. I don't know, Michael, if you want to add to that. No, I, I, I would agree. Uh, I, I would just take on the, there was a question about uh, health effects, I think. So uh, in the safety of this room in the LSE, of course the right measure is uh, a measure of willingness to pay. Uh, and uh, the world is super imperfect, uh, and normal humans don't really relate to that very well, uh, but they do relate to things like how much you know, you know shorter will my life be. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that uh, can be uh, very effective. And uh, actually, I started the Air Quality Life Index exactly because uh, what is commonly used is called the AQI, the Air Quality Index. And like it makes me want to pull my hair out. Like I can't remember if purple's worse than brown yeah. or orange is better than yellow, and like all the thing, you know, it doesn't relate to anything about uh, people's well-being. Uh, and since normal humans don't like willingness to pay, it seemed like focusing on health uh, would, uh, was an alternative. Terrific, thank you. I can see we've got about 15 seconds left, yeah. but Omar, I'm just going to give you a, 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 those 15 seconds, if you, if you will, to for, uh, respond you to know, For way. Lahore, it is, I think uh, we, we have a public transport infrastructure, it's just more rebound. So, uh, you know, we need to revive public transport. We need to get more into non-motorized type of public transport, more walking, more cycling. Uh, I grew up in Lahore, and there used to be sidewalks, and there used to be bicycles, and it used to be a very vibrant city. It's no longer, and there used to be more public transport available. It's simply not there. Before we really get into the complicated stuff of having a Euro 6 engine or having high octane content in fuel or developing transit oriented uh, development, that's longer term. But immediately, uh, you know, there is an infrastructure and there is a blueprint available. Uh, the question is of resources, but you know, uh, Non-motorized transport does not take a lot of resources. Uh, and, and finally, there was this issue of framing. I completely buy your point, you know, this, uh, this unfairness of this whole thing, that when it's our turn to become rich, all of a sudden this environment thing, you know, comes into being. Uh, that, that argument will, will always be there. Uh, we are not going to wish it away, we are not going to ignore it, but the argument which was just made by the gentleman from masters in health policy is that the health issue is more critical and you frame it and juxtapose these two arguments. Do you, find, do you want to find the equity battle or do you want to find, uh, fight the survival battle? I'll, I'll rather go for the survival battle. Terrific. So I'm sorry to cut short such a, an interesting discussion, um, but I uh, want to thank everybody here for participating. just want to remind everybody that we've got two more public events on Tuesday and Thursday, so please do uh, look up the LSE Environment Week programme uh, for those. But I'd like to end, if you will, uh, join me in thanking our panellists very, very much indeed for such a, a fascinating session. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you.